Right, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Worthington Presbyterian Church. Uh, great to see all of you uh, here in the sanctuary, and also a welcome to everybody joining us out in the parking lot and uh, on our live stream as we come together in worship this morning uh, to celebrate uh, Easter Sunday. There are so many great Easter hymns that we're going to start today a little bit differently than usual. We're fitting a little bit more music in today. Um, so we're going to jump right in with a hymn of praise. Uh, if you'll please rise and join together in number 367, Christ the Lord is Risen Today.
be seated. All right, now a couple of announcements uh, as we get started today. Um, first off, thank you to uh, everybody who made a flower purchase. They're, they're definitely uh, livening up the sanctuary this morning. And a reminder, if you did order flowers, please uh, pick them up following this morning's service. Uh, also, a couple of upcoming uh, events that are noted uh, in your bulletin just to draw your attention to. Uh, we are making plans for our graduate Sunday uh, ceremony, and we are also uh, beginning preparations for vacation Bible school. So if either graduate Sunday or VBS uh, would apply to uh, any children in your household, uh, please take a look there uh, for a little bit more information. Uh, are there any uh, announcements from the congregation as we get started today? Okay. Seeing none, I invite you to uh, please join together in our call, of to, uh, call to worship as printed in your bulletin. This morning's call comes from Psalm 118. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Now I invite you to please rise and join together in hymn of praise number 368, He Lives.
now uh, please join together in this morning's prayer of confession is printed in the bulletin. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin, that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let our lives be a testimony to your salvation through the love of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this morning's assurance uh, of Christ's love uh, comes from John uh, chapter 1. Uh, it's actually one of the, the verses of scripture that uh, Steve uh, included on his comments uh, Thursday at our Monday Thursday service. And I, I thought that discussion uh, of the, the way in, in which the Lord would ultimately provide the lamb uh, spoke uh, very well for, for uh, this morning's assurance. So uh, John chapter 1, uh, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Amen. special music from the children's choir.
Thank you so much. All right, you know I got to say it. Christ is risen. No. Christ is risen. You can do better than that. Christ is risen. Now we can begin. Thank you so much. Looking at uh, Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter this morning. We're going to be reading verses 36 through 49. After the resurrection, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Let us pray. Most gracious God, as we think back to that glorious morning, I'm sure that those disciples just didn't know how to comprehend what had happened. Please, Bless us to understand. Open up our minds to the scriptures, to this scripture, that we may grasp what has taken place and that we may give you the joy and honor and thanksgiving that in all this, all this was done for those who believe in you and the promises that are made and are made certain through this fact, Jesus Christ has risen. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When uh, Justin, if some of you, if you don't know, Justin, who was, you know, that's my son-in-law, all right? Uh, when he married Kate, he didn't really know what he was getting into as far as the farm was concerned, all right? You know, they married, and eventually they moved back to the farm. Uh, you know, my girls grew up. They, they understood what it was to drive tractors, move hay around, you know, push cattle, all right? All those things. Uh, inevitably, if you were on a farm, and around a lot of farm animals, you have to experience the death of a farm animal, all right? Well, all new stuff for Justin, and he took it very well in stride. Uh, but he was working at home one morning, and his uh, office where he has set up in the house, it has a window looking out towards the highway, and down in the pasture there, he looks, and he sees my brother-in-law's horse down there, and it's just laid out flat. He's like, it's dead. I mean, he's just... Certainly, I mean, he's watching it. It never moves. He watched it for a long period of time. Nothing. This horse is dead. All right, now you know what you're going to say. What do you do? What do you do with a dead horse? I mean, do you Google it? Do you ask Siri, Siri, what do I do with a dead horse? You know? <laughs> what do you do? All right? If I call Bob, what if Bob asked me to help him? How do you handle a dead horse? Do you grab him by the feet? Do you grab him by the tail? I mean, what do you do? Can you lift a dead horse? I mean, they're, they're as heavy as a dead horse, all right? What do you do with a dead horse? And he can't call his friends at work, you know, down in Pittsburgh because, you know, they think he already lives in a third world country up here, right? <laughs> so what are they going to They say, oh, take a picture of it. Now, wait a second. Now, is, it, is it proper to take a picture of a dead horse and send it over the Internet? I mean, you know, is there any? They, 
he's really having problems with this, all right? You can imagine all the thoughts going through his mind, okay? And then, what if I do call Bob? Is he going to want me to help dig a hole for it? Should I get a shovel out? Should I find some gloves? I, uh, he just, it just, I don't, what if he asked me to go down and cover it up? You know, right there at the highway, everybody sees what's going on at the Heinemann Farm, okay? You don't hide anything. And what do I cover it up with if he wants me to cover it up? All good questions, huh? You know what his answer was? I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and let somebody else deal with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Get it out of my mind. i got to get back to work. And that's what he did. He went back to work, and he's trying to concentrate. But that window's right there. And, you know, every time you look out, you know, there's a, you know, so he's working and working. Finally, he looks out, and he, all of a sudden, you know what he saw? <gasps> Lo and behold, the horse is standing up. <laughs> now, obviously, he never experienced a dead horse in the pasture, but he also never experienced a sleeping horse in the pasture either, all right? It's one of those things. How do you deal with experiences that you've never encountered before? All right? On Thursday, you know, I, was, I wasn't doing the, the, uh, the message, and I came up, I did a reading, and went back, and there's Kenna, and she looked at me, she goes, you don't belong back here. <laughs> but fortunately, she had parents who could tell her what this was all about and explain it to her. And experiencing something for the very first time, that nobody has ever experienced. How do you explain that? Think about Neil Armstrong. Who is there around that could explain to him what it's going to be like to walk on the moon? Huh? A whole new Nobody can. You, can. you can say, well, I think it might. I think it might. No. Nobody can ever explain that to him. How about the Wright brothers? This is what it's going to be like when you fly. Most people would try before they hit the ground, all right? You think about this. How do you explain something? that has never, ever happened before. The disciples were in that, that same position, trying to experience and explain this, this, this resurrection that has happened. And Lazarus doesn't count. Lazarus, who Jesus brought out of the tomb, he wasn't resur resurrected in the same way that Jesus is resurrected. He came back to life, but he would die again. In Matthew chapter 27, we read about the, the saints who came out of the tombs. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died and were raised to life. But most see this as this isn't the same resurrection that Jesus Christ is demonstrating to us. As, as James Montgomery Boyce writes, this does not mean that the resurrection of those who came out of their tombs at the time of Christ's death was their final resurrection. I imagine that they all died again. But while theirs was not the final resurrection, it was a resurrection, and it pointed to the day when all who are Christ will be raised. It was different. Nobody had ever experienced before. N.T. Wright explains the stories of the resurrection contain this marks that marks them out as among the most mysterious stories ever written. Definite signs that this body has been transformed. It is clearly physical. It uses up, so to speak, the matter of the crucified body, hence the empty tomb. But equally, it comes and goes through locked doors. It is not always recognized, and in the end, it disappears into God's space. That is heaven through the thin curtain that in much Jewish thought, separates God's space from human space. This kind of account is without precedent. No biblical text, listen, no biblical text predict that the resurrection will involve this kind of body. No speculative theology had laid this trail for the evangelists to follow. They had nothing to go by. And so it was all new. And what Jesus had to do was he opened their minds to the scriptures. And they could look back and see that this was all something that God had been planning for from the very, very beginning, from Adam's sin. This was God's plan. And they could see it, and they could then understand the resurrection. 
And that's the same thing for us today. You can't go down to downtown Catania and find anybody who's resurrected down there and talk to them and try. No, there's only been one. There will be many more to come. But so far, there's only one resurrection. And so for us to understand it, what it means for us today, we have to go to God's word. And we pray that God will open up our minds so that we also can understand and apply this to our lives. Jesus says, while he was with them, he came to him, he says, peace be with you, peace be with you. Last week, we talked about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, all right? Palm Sunday. He came as the king of peace. We looked at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding a donkey, on a coat, the full of a donkey. He came as the king of peace, as Boyce points out. The donkey did symbolize that Jesus was coming in peace, not for war, and that this was to be a gentle, peaceful reign. Zechariah, the, not Zechariah the prophet, but Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. When his son was born, he was able to proclaim to God in a song of praise. And he said this, Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. What Zechariah is describing here is pilgrims who are traveling through the, you know, in the wilderness and darkness overtakes them. And like somebody was saying about earlier in the, in the garden and the women coming early in the morning, they didn't have flashlights, did they? They couldn't see their way. And so they had to stop there for the night. Night in the wilderness meant the danger of wild animals, robbers, thieves. You, know, you didn't know. There was a terror of being out in the wilderness at night. And this idea that there they are and the fear that there surrounds them, death might be in their doorstep, and yet when they see the sun rising in the morning, and it brings peace to them. Now they can see. Now they can continue their journey without fear, right? That's what he's describing here. Death is always at our doorstep. Every one of us, we never know when that day will come. But we have peace. Why? Because of what God has done through Jesus Christ and the resurrection. When Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, all those people were saying, Hosanna, oh, they were so thankful. Here comes Jesus. He's going to solve our problems today, all right? Solve our problems but they were only thinking about their present day problems. They weren't thinking about really what they should be concerned about. What happens after I die? That concern. They weren't thinking future problems, only present problems. You see, we live our lives so much as Noah did. Remember Noah? All right? It's estimated that he spent possibly 40 years building the ark. He didn't spend probably every single waking moment building the ark, all right? He still had a family to care for. He had to work, all right? You always understand that. You go to work and you come home. What do you do then? Well, then you go work on the ark, all right? You spend until night time working on the ark. You've had projects that you've had to get done and you worked on. You mean, that, that takes a little bit of sacrifice, doesn't it? Might mean giving up a few little league games. That doesn't have to say you got to give them all, but you might have to take a little time. You have to work. It may mean not giving up Saturday afternoon watching all the college football games, all right? It may mean not spending the evening out with the guys and having a good time every night. It means you dedicate and you're working towards something. And what was he working towards? The building of the ark, the ark which represents Jesus Christ who protected him from the wrath of God. That's what he was working towards. And he had peace in that. He wasn't worried about the flood that was coming because he's working towards and he had that peace of knowing God would take care of him. You have purpose 
This peace gives you purpose in your life. Purpose in your life. God brings peace between you and God. The sin that you have committed in your life, and we all have those sins. The purpose for God is to put wrath upon you for all your sin, but yet that is removed. And so what we find, as Riken points out, the immediate gratification of what we have at this moment, what we need more than anything else is to have the right relationship with God. And this can only come through the forgiveness of our sins. To be specific, although we will not see this until we get to the end of Luke's gospel, a right relationship with God can only come through the cross where Jesus died for sinners. As Luke was later to write, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. As those people were looking for Jesus to solve all their problems for the day, make my life wonderful, they didn't see the real purpose for Jesus coming. That he was going to save them from the wrath of God, save them from hell. C.S. Lewis describes it this way. He has forced open the door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has opened. This is the peace that Jesus Christ brings. This is the peace that we have in the resurrection. In the resurrection. But you can imagine trying to deal with that first experience that nobody else has seen, nobody else has experienced before. A resurrected body, a resurrected Jesus. He's not a a ghost or a spirit, but he's a real person, a real person. And yet people's view of what, what is your view? I mean, something we were talking about up in uh, the Sunday school class this morning. What do you think will happen after you die? Huh? What do you think happens? Amazingly, all right, in a study done back in 2006, one out of three Americans believe that after they die, their bodies will rise again. That's only one-third of the people really believe in a bodily resurrection. Lisa Miller, she points out that the afterlife, she has found that 80% of Americans believe in heaven but have no idea what that means. And also that 25% of Christians believe in reincarnation. 25% of Christians. Reincarnation. Doesn't work like that. She has concluded, right? Although she likes the idea of resurrection, she doesn't really believe in it. And she concludes that we are becoming more Hindu in regard to what happens after we die and less Christian. See, people have this Wiley e. Coyote type of view on what happens, all right? Do you know who Wiley e. Coyote is? The Roadrunner? Beep, beep, boom, 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 yeah. How many times did Wile E. Coyote get killed in those cartoons, huh? He either falls off a cliff a thousand feet, he blows himself up, he has an acme anvil come and hit him on the head, and yet what happens? He keeps killing back. That's what people's view is. We just keep coming back and we just keep working. No! As the writer of the Hebrews said, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. You only die one time. You only get one chance at this. And that's it. Michael Horton, he adds about the resurrection. Paul tells us that we will have the same body only in a different condition. He says that what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. The key, the key, is a continuity between the body that dies and the body that is raised to life. It is not a different body. It is the same body in a different form, in a different condition. He doesn't say that what is sown is physical and what is raised is spiritual. Rather, he says that what is sown as perishable is raised imperishable. Imperishable. The resurrection is a life changing experience. 
Jesus had been telling these disciples over and over and over again of what was going to happen. The scriptures told them what was going to happen to them. And when it did happen to them, they didn't understand it. It's because they just did not have that kind of faith that they needed. If they really believed what Jesus was telling them, if they really believed that when, when he said to them that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to suffer under the hands of the high priests and the Pharisees, he was going to die, put in the grave, and be raised on the third day, if, he, if they believed that, where would they have been that Sunday morning? At the tomb waiting, right? But none of them were, were they? Where were they? They're hiding. Because they just couldn't quite grasp and believe it. That's what so many of us are. Disciples were the same, hot and cold. Sometimes our faith is just so strong and so certain, and other times it's not. It's cold. We doubt. We don't think God, yeah, God doesn't hear me. But yet, what we have to understand, true faith, true faith never gets around to thinking that God won't do what he said he'll do. That was the faith of Abraham. Paul, in his letter to the Roman church, he said to them about Abraham, he says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised to do. The resurrection, Jesus Christ is that first example of the resurrection, and he promises that, guess what? You will be like him. When that day comes, you will be like him. Do you believe that and do you trust in that, that no matter what happens in this life, you will be like him? That's what faith is. That no matter how sick I get, no matter how, how death is right in my, in my face, I will be like him. I'll be like him. The resurrection is a fact. It's an event in history that cannot be disputed. People do, but the church has hold it, held up as a fact. Tim Keller, he reminds us that the resurrection since the days it was first preached was a fact, not an experience. He says, you know what facts are like? There's a fact. I don't like it. I wish it wasn't there but it is. What am I going to do about it? I have to accept it. But that isn't the way American culture works. Our culture is about likes and dislikes. I like this, I don't like this. But with the resurrection, it is a fact. You accept it as such or you reject it. There's nothing in between. The resurrection, it's a fact. It happened. We know Jesus is alive. And we see it from the very beginning of Scripture, how God has laid this out and worked his way all the way up to the fact of the resurrection, the resurrection. That's what Jesus had to do. The miracle itself, they didn't know how to process it. They didn't know how to deal with it. That's why Jesus had to open their minds to the scripture. He had to go from the beginning to the end and explain it to them. And then they could see, and it made sense. How many think that the cross of Jesus Christ makes sense to us? It doesn't. It seems like the least likely way that we would accomplish anything. We would try to do it. But God did it that way. And so to be able to understand it, we have to go to Scripture for him to explain it. This is exactly how it had to happen. It had to happen in this way. Kent Hughes comments, is, Jesus did not want them to rest their, un their belief in his resurrection on their personal experience alone. Resting their faith on a miracle was not sufficient 
He wanted them to be grounded, their experience of his resurrection on the massive testimony of the perspective of, the perspective of Scripture. He wanted their faith not to be based on what they saw because sometimes those things get to be, you know, people dispute them. You know, really and truly, you know, um, Randall Collins, he points out how facts, all right, something happens, it's a fact, all right, and everybody believes it. And then somebody comes along, he's an outlier, he says, oh, it didn't really happen. And he said, oh, or it happened this way, it happened this way. And it's disputed back and forth for a while, and then finally they prove that this person over here is all wrong. But what happens is some people move a little bit towards that person. And the fact that you started out with seems to be moved a little bit towards the center, and then people gravitate towards that, and that becomes the accepted. All right? We can't do that with the resurrection because to change it in any way means we have to change everything that came before that because they all point to this fact, Jesus Christ and the resurrection. That's why Jesus said, he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. It isn't just their experience of seeing a risen Lord, but it's a vast quantity of Scripture that points towards it. That's why Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. What we see in Scripture is what we, we, we term as a, a through line, all right? Curtis Chang, he describes what a through line is. He goes, it is the through line is usually an underlying motivation that connects the character's past, present, and future. The moment the audience so-and-so wouldn't have done that because this new action was so disconnected from what came before it, the story starts to ring false. By the way, this doesn't mean that the stories that can't contain surprises. Quite the contrary. The best stories must include unexpected twists, but the twist must make sense by remaining connected to the through line. Let me break that down. The through line. What is the through line of, of the scriptures? Adam gets thrown out of the garden because of sin, right? What is the through line? God trying to get us back into his presence, back into the garden. That's what the whole Bible is about. Until Jesus Christ comes back, reestablishes his, his, his kingdom here on earth, Changes everything, the resurrection. That's what we're getting back to, all right? And that's the story, how God is going to do that. The cross seems to be that twist that doesn't seem to work out in our minds. Doesn't seem to work out that way, doesn't seem. But it's exactly how God planned it. He first had to deal with sin, and then he had to defeat death. And then comes the resurrection. It is that getting back back to what God has intended to us for us all along. This is a story we see all through Scripture. We see it through God preserving through, through Shem, the, 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 the son of Noah, and then through Abraham, the story of the seed that was promised in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. We see it progressing through Abraham, then through the, the patriarchs, and then through David, and through all those up until the time of Jesus. And then all people... And the promise to, to Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That promise working its way through Scripture until we get to Jesus. And then the cross and the resurrection. People, whenever Jesus came into Jerusalem, were Hosanna. Yeah. They were welcoming Jesus. Oh, this is great. Jesus is coming in. In reality, they didn't realize how big a deal it was. It was a big deal, all right? They thought that he was coming to take care of all their problems, get rid of the rooms. They did not realize how big a deal it really was, that he was coming to save them and take them back into paradise. C.S. Lewis describes our, our problem with not thinking big enough. He says, indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward, and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels. 
it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We don't think big enough, grand enough. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, are you more concerned about give us, our day, give us this day our daily bread? Or thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Which one is more important to you? Your daily bread or God's kingdom to come? Think big. And the resurrection is big. It's bigger than any of us could ever understand. Once you understand and see the resurrection and, and, and can grasp it, what does it do? It produces repentance and forgiveness. You come to God and you know that what he has done for you and you repent your sins to him. It re requires a response from us. That repentance, you know, something and forgiveness comes, you know, good example of it, there's a tribe in Tanzania. And there, if you commit a sin against the, the tribe, you are an outcast, you're put out, and you have to go away and you have to live by yourself. And then at times, when you get older and getting closer to death, and you repent of that, you can come back. The process for coming back is that you have to come outside the city wall. There a, a lamb is sacrificed. And then you must have the blood sprinkled upon you, and there's a little door in the wall of the, of the, of the city, and you have to bow down and get on your hands and knees and go through that little door and come back into the city. Humility. To come before God in humble repentance. And he will forgive. He will forgive. The resurrection, it changes lives. And people are never the same after that. Every one of those people who saw the risen Lord, what did he do afterwards? They told somebody. Right? The women, when they went to the, to the tomb, and they saw the risen Lord, and they went and they told the disciples. On the road to Emmaus, when the disciples finally realized that they had seen the risen Lord, what did they do? They went from Emmaus all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. When Paul, when Paul saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, what did he spend the rest of his life doing? Telling people about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is a sign of the true understanding of the resurrection. To repent and to tell people about it. To tell people about it. Amen. Let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, as we look to you for every day, for our daily bread. But let us also be reminded that we long for your kingdom. We would like to see things get better, but they're not really going to get better until you return. We pray for that day. We long for that day. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, save us. We pray that people with this, with the hope that this, of this inevitable event of your coming will share it with others. We pray, Lord, that those who are in need of this hope in their lives, that you will strengthen them, encourage them, that you will grant them healing. We pray, Lord, for Linda and Jesse and Joyce and Sandy and Harold and Linda, Arnie, Robert, Diane, Nora, Penny, John, Russ, Jeff, Brad, Braden, Dan, Nicholas, Rick, Aaron, and Lana. For Carlton and Ann, Mary, Edgar, Linda, Tim, Aiden, Jack, Jerry, Maverick, Barney, Jackie, and Mason. For those in the military, for Caitlin and Skylar and Ava, 
and for those who have lost loved ones, for the families of Edith and Shirley, Loretta and Jean. And great God, we lift up to you the prayer that you have given us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and join in our final hymn this morning, selection number 357. Continuing in uh, Luke chapter 24, beginning verse 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. John Guest was an Anglican minister who uh, moved from Britain to the United States back in the 70s. And he was you know, going around looking... Uh, learning about the America, and he went to a museum. And there was a sign that had been over top of a tavern in Philadelphia back during the Revolutionary War. And it read this, We serve no sovereign here. Right? Now, coming from Britain, he realized, you know, hey, they bow to the sovereigns. You know, most of Europe understood what it meant to bow to the sovereign. Here, we don't bow to I, I tell you what, you better bow to Jesus Christ and acknowledge him as your sovereign and Lord. That's what the resurrection brings us to do, to bow down to Jesus Christ. 
please, don't let your freedoms, don't let your pride, don't let anything keep you from acknowledging him as Lord of your life. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit humble you from that resurrected morning that you will bow down to him forever. Amen.